Good morning, Destiny Life. Yes, I love it. Buckle up. Let's get ready to go. It's going to be awesome. Okay, so we have been walking through this super normal summer series, and we've been walking through the book of Acts, and uh, just to kind of bring all of you up to speed, we're going to jump right into that. So back in the beginning of June, we started with the book of Acts, talking through Acts chapter 1. And in Acts chapter 1, we find the disciples, and they're there in the upper room, and they're afraid, and they're hiding behind locked doors. And Jesus tells them, don't leave, but wait here until you receive the Holy Spirit. And when you do, you'll receive power to become a witness in Judea and Jerusalem and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so they do that. They stay there. And then uh, on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, the Holy Spirit falls. They receive power. Peter busts open the doors. He proclaims to the crowd. And 3,000 are added to their number that day. And the church is born and it begins, and we begin to see the spread of the gospel as it goes all over the place. And so we've talked through all of that spread. In Acts 1 through 7, we find them in Jerusalem encountering different things and receiving the Holy Spirit, and healings and miraculous things are happening, and the gospel is expanding and spreading until Acts chapter 7 when Stephen is martyred. And this is the first time when it's meant death to the church. And so out of that, the persecution spreads all the Christians. The apostles stay in Jerusalem, and the rest of the Christians go about preaching the word all over the place. And we talk through different places that they went and where they were and how many miles this thing is exploding and all the things that are happening through that. And we find this guy named Saul who is not so happy about it. And so he is there at Stephen's execution, this mob-style murder where they stone him, and he's holding the coats. And he gets this prescription from the religious authorities to take this persecution everywhere that the church is. And he goes out on his way to Damascus to squash the church. He finds Jesus on the road to Damascus. And Jesus appears and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, the one you persecute. And out of that, he receives the Lord, and he begins this incredible conversion. And he, uh, a guy named Ananias prays for him, and he regains his sight and receives the Holy Spirit and begins to grow in the things of the Lord. And immediately, he begins to preach the gospel. And they can't believe it. And then as they go on, then the, he begins to grow in the faith, and the church continues to spread, and Philip is sharing the faith all over the place, and the church is continuing to grow, and out of joy, the church multiplies, and out of unity, the church multiplies, and out of love, the church multiplies, and by his spirit, the church multiplies. And that's been our theme for this year, love goes by his spirit. We've been looking at this, and what makes these guys so incredible? And then we've come to, last week, we're talking about Acts chapter 13, and we have Paul in, he's Saul, and he is in the church at Antioch. And you've got these incredible guys, this incredibly diverse group of leaders that are praying and ministering in Antioch, and the beauty of the tapestry of what God has made into the church and what he's called us to do and to be. And out of that, these guys are sent. In Acts chapter 13, verse 4, it says, and sent by the Holy Spirit, they go. And that begins Paul's first missionary journey. And that's where we pick it up today in Acts chapter 13. And we're talking about being super normal. What does that mean for all of us? What does it mean to be super normal? Well, to break that down, we all know what normal is, what normal looks like, but to be super. And so Webster's Dictionary says that super is above or beyond. It's an individual thing or property that exceeds customary norms or levels. That we want to be above and beyond normal in this life. We want to exceed the customary level of what it looks like to go through your in and out every day. We want to be above and beyond that. We want to be super normal. And in that, there are a lot of things that are super like that. You've heard of Superman. You know, he is, he's a man, but he's Superman. He's awesome. He can fly and, you know, punch things and jump with a single bound, all that stuff. So that's Superman. And then you have a super computer where you have like, you know, you've got your laptop, my laptop, your desktop, if you've got one of those, and like all that stuff, those are computers. But then you've got a super computer. You'd expect that to be bigger and faster and smarter and better. It's a super computer. You've seen a super highway. You've got 169, which we talked about last week, that beautiful piece of work. Or you've got a super highway, like we're going to have in Highway 20 right through here someday. Lord, believe it. So it's going to happen. Come on, somebody. There we go. All right. 
that we need that super highway. Like, so it's going to be an exciting thing for us. We're excited about that. You know, and then we have my favorite, supercalifragilistic expialidocious. It's a really incredible thing. Even just the thought of it is simply quite atrocious. It's amazing. So that is, wow. Thank you, someone, for laughing. I appreciate the four of you that, yeah, I got that, yeah. The rest of you need to go watch Mary Poppins. So it's awesome. That's super. That's what we're called to be. We want to be super normal. And today I want to talk to you about what it looks like. Justin just left. He said, I'm done. I'm out of here. So running them off one by one. All right, good to go. So out of that, we're going to look at what it means to be super normal and have super normal courage today. Four things out of the life of Paul that encourage us to have super normal courage. Because the truth is, the other thing that's super is that life is super hard Things don't always go the way that you want them to. In fact, most of the plans that I make don't come out the way that I want them to come out because life is challenging and difficult and it's hard to walk through this life. We face opposition and challenges and circumstances and situations that you may not have been prepared for. In fact, if you aren't walking through a situation or if you haven't walked through a situation, get ready because you're about to walk through a situation that you weren't prepared for. We are always in a process of going through life in one of those three areas. I'm either about to go into, walking through, or coming out of a challenge in my life. And the truth is that that's just a part of life. It's super hard. But we're called to be more than that. In fact, there are some people... And when they respond to that, their response is just to give up, shift into neutral mode, let things just coast for a while, walk away from it all, pull into themselves and isolate and just be, just put it on coast and just exist. Then there are some people that just seem for some reason, no matter what life throws at them, they get knocked down, they just pop back up and keep going. No matter what happens, when life comes against them, they're going to make it through. They're going to come back even stronger and even better. And Paul, our buddy Saul, is one of those guys. In fact, he says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, just listen to some of the challenges that he went through. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Now, the, the, the difference there, the Jewish leaders gave them 39 lashes because they had counted it out, and they knew that 40 lashes would kill you. And they weren't allowed to kill anyone because God said, do not murder. So they'd pull it down one notch, and they'll give you 39 lashes. Now, beating with rods, that was a Roman thing. So when Paul got imprisoned by the Romans, he was beat with rods. And when he got captured by the Jewish, he was whipped with lashes. He says, he goes on to say, once I was stoned. We'll talk about that today. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I've faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Here's a guy who has been through it. He's been through some difficulty and some hard times, and he's faced so many different challenges, and yet he's able to say this in 2 Corinthians, we are pressed on every side by troubles but we are not crushed and broken. We are perplexed, but we don't give up and quit. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again and keep going. We keep going. We get knocked down, but we get up again and we keep going. Now, what would make a guy do that? How many times would it take for you to get lashed 39 times or beaten with rods before you say, hey, you know what? I think I'm good. (laughs) I'll just stay down. It's all right. But he says, not us. No, we don't do that. We're crushed, but we don't stop. We're perplexed, but we're not abandoned. We're beaten down, but we're not destroyed. We're going to get up and we're going to keep going. What makes a guy do that? What makes a guy have that kind of super normal courage, no matter what challenge or situation he's facing. 
I want to walk to the book of Acts today, starting with Acts 13. We're going to go to Acts 18. And in these five chapters, we're going to see the life of Paul and how he responds and how he is able to, in the midst of these situations, come through it with supernormal courage. And so we begin in Acts chapter 13, verse 4. We sent them out on the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas, and they have with them this guy, John Mark. So Paul is there. He would call him Saul, but his name is Paul in the, now in chapter 16, and uh, Barnabas is along with him and John Mark. So you could say it's PB and J. So PB and J are headed out on their first missionary journey. Yes, I got to laugh on that one. All right. Uh, and so as they go out, they come to the island of Cyprus. And as they get there, they meet this guy named Elenus. And Elenus is a sorcerer, and uh, he has kind of got his hand on the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. And so Paul quiets him and makes him blind. And then uh, out of that, Sergius Paulus received the Lord. And this is an amazing thing. And the whole island of Cyprus is really uh, converted by the gospel and it begins to spread there. And then out of that, John Mark has some kind of issue and he takes off and heads back to Jerusalem. So now it's just P and B and J took off. So Jerus- uh, John Mark has now gone back to Jerusalem and Paul and Barnabas continue on. And they come to Lystra and Derby. And as they're ministering through these towns, they come to this place called Lystra, where they are presented, and they come into this place, and they find a guy, and he has, his ankles don't work. His, he been, he's had issues with his feet, and he can't walk. And Paul heals him. And the people think, man, this guy healed a guy. He must be a god. And so they begin to worship him. They say that Paul is Hermes, because he does all the speaking, and Barnabas must be Zeus, because, as we talked about earlier, I just think he's this big bear of a guy. And so they think he's Zeus because of what he looks like. And so out of that, they, they begin to worship them, and they can't stop them from worshiping them. So Paul and Barnabas try all that they can, but they can't stop him. And some Jews come into town, and they begin to rally against them, and immediately like that, this mob that was worshiping Paul and Barnabas turn on them and drag them outside the city. In Acts chapter 14, it says this, Then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side, They stoned Paul and dragged him out of town, thinking he was dead. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into the town. The next day, he left with Barnabas for Derby. How does a guy get stoned, drug out of town because they think he's dead, and then he gets up and he goes back into the town? That's amazing. To me, that's just incredible. That This guy would be so obviously dead that they drag him out of town and the disciples gather around him, probably praying for his healing. And then he gets up and he goes back into town. And then the next day he leaves for a new place. So what happens in Paul's life? How does Paul process these things? The first thing is that he is able to tell God exactly how he feels. And we have to do that. Whenever you face a situation or a circumstance, you need to be able to express to God, to confess to God exactly how you feel. We all have stuff we go through. We all have trials and challenges. But I need to be able to unload all of my feelings and release all of my frustrations to God. And you'll be amazed at how much better you feel when you do that. Paul did that. In fact, we read here in 2 Corinthians that he says, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. Paul says, I begged three times, God, take this away. And I can imagine the first time he was just frustrated. And then the second time he was complaining, it's still here, God, take it away. And then he finally gets to a place of acceptance that this is what God has called him to. And I will boast only in my weakness so that God can be glorified. And there's something in that for us. Did you know that releasing your frustrations to God, releasing your, your needs and your, your emotions to God is actually worship? When you do that, you're really worshiping God. Because I can suppress it or repress it. I can push it down and can it up. Or I can express it. I can complain to all of you about all the stuff that I feel and how frustrated I am. 
or I can confess it. I can bring it to God and I can say, God, this is where I am. I want you to know this is how I feel. I want to just pour it all out to you. And God says, when you do that, that's worship because you're coming to him as the source. You're looking to him for guidance and for help in that area instead of pressing it down or spreading it around, but instead coming to him. Paul was brutally honest. He says, three times I begged the Lord. Three times he begged and pleaded, God, take this thing away. And yet it never happened. The right response to an unexplained tragedy, when we come through stuff in our lives that we just don't understand, the right response is not to grin and bear it. I know that's the Sunday school answer. I grew up with the Sunday school answers. I know all about the Sunday school answers. But the right response in that situation is not to just grin and bear it and you can do it. Just pull you up by your bootstraps and keep on a trucking. That's not going to get you there. It's not pious platitudes. Well, you know, Jesus is Lord. Because if you're not sincere about that, if that's not really where you are, then you're faking it. And you have to be real about where it is. God wants you to be real with your emotions. He wants to connect with you because the reality is you only have emotions because you were made in the image of God. You can read all through the Bible and you'll see that he is mad and he's frustrated and he's angry and he's good and he's kind and he's loving and he's joyful. All this range of emotions only is in us because it comes from God. And so I can come back to him and I can reflect myself back to him as an act of worship when I'm even frustrated about where I am, even about the situations that I find in my life. The other reality of that is that's what we should do. You know, Ethan is getting to a part, he's, you know, eight, he'll be nine in February, and he's kind of getting to that area where, you know, this may be a surprise to all of you, but sometimes he challenges my wisdom. Sometimes he doesn't really appreciate this copious amounts of wisdom that I can expound upon him. And so now he never questions that I'm older than him. He never questions that I've lived longer than he is, than he has. He never questions that I love him as his father, but sometimes he has issues with my wisdom. And so it's in those times I would rather we talk it out and I explain to him and we can have a conversation than he just get frustrated and walk away. Because then, if that happens, if you just get frustrated and you walk away, eventually what's going to happen is that Coke bottle is going to explode. You can press it in and you can shake it up sideways, and eventually it's all going to come out some way. Maybe an addiction, maybe an outburst, maybe some other problem in your life, but it's going to come out. But instead, you can go to God and you can give it to Him. And when you do, you're in really good company. You're not alone. In fact, there are many people that did that. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, you deceived me, God. Naomi said, you call me, call me bitter. Change my name to bitter because God has made my life bitter. David said, I've taken the worst you can hand out and I'm done. I've had it. Job said, I cry out because I've been wronged. You threw me in the mud. These guys were expressing right where they felt. Job is extremely He's extremely agitated and very, his words there throughout the first seven chapters of Job, he's talking about all this stuff in very clear detail about why his life is now awful. And he says, God, you've thrown me in the mud. My life is shamed. I mean, I don't know many people, I don't know anybody that's gone through everything that Job did in a 24-hour period. He has every right to be frustrated and to come to God and just expound on that. And we do too. In fact, in Lamentations, it says, 219, cry out in the night, pour out your heart like water in prayer to the Lord. That's what we're supposed to do. Cry out to God in the night. Pour out our heart in prayer to the Lord. That's what we do. In order to really come through our situation, our circumstances with courage, that we should come to the Lord and express to him how we feel. So out of that, Paul is begging the Lord to remove this thorn in his flesh. And then we move on. He gets up in Lystra. He goes on. And they go on to other cities. And they continue to preach and to proclaim. And as they come to Acts chapter 15, 
the, the city in Jerusalem, the, the council in Jerusalem has this big debate over circumcision, and they decide that, that what God has poured out to the Gentiles is really for all of us, that it's not by works that we're saved, but it's through our own faith. And so Peter stands up and says, why should we put on the Gentile believers a yoke that is on our necks that we haven't been able to bear? And so because of that, God saves by faith, not by works. And so they send that back to Antioch, and they're all rejoicing. And so Paul and Barnabas get together, and they decide that they should take this word, and they should go back to all the cities that they've been to before. And when they do that, they begin to converse about that and the plan, and they put it together, and who should go, and all those things. And we find it here in Acts chapter 15, verse 36. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted to him the Lord's gracious care. Entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. So I, I love that this is in here, that these guys, these apostles, these foundations of faith that we look to have disagreements, that they have challenges in life, that they're not just super, they are normal also. So we are normal like them. We can all be this together. I love that Luke includes this in Acts, just to kind of give us a glimpse that not everything is peachy keen all the time, that even though they go through these incredible things and you think, how could they respond that way? But they have challenges too. And in this challenge, in Acts chapter 16, we see that Saul has a problem with the fact that John Mark left them in Cyprus in their first journey. And so he doesn't want to take him along on the second journey because he hasn't been to all the other places. Paul doesn't know if he can trust him. He's not sure how effective he's going to be. Can he really be a part of this team? And Barnabas, you know, we know him. He's Joseph, now called Barnabas. He's the son of encouragement. You know, he's like, oh, come on, Paul, give him a second chance. I know he's got it in him. Let's just do this. You know, Barnabas is this encourager, and he wants John Mark to get another opportunity. But Saul is dead set against it, and so they split ways. And I've had this vision of, like, uh, this picture of, like, the softball field a couple weeks ago. We're, like, picking teams. So Paul's up there, and he says, well, if they're not going, then, uh, okay, I'll take Silas. Silas, you're on my team. Let's go. And so they head off, and they go separate ways. And so Barnabas and John Mark take off one way, and Paul and Silas head off in a different direction. And this is Paul's second missionary journey. Now, the interesting thing here, and what I want us to see from this, is that if we're going to walk through things with supernormal courage, we have to be able to accept help from other people. We have to be open and able to accept help from others. I love that this whole narrative is here in Acts, because when we see it later in 2 Timothy, this is something beautiful to look at and to see, this process of growth and change that happens in Paul's life. And if this can happen in Paul's life, I want you to know and to receive for yourself that it can happen in your life. In fact, in 2 Timothy verse four, chapter 4, verse 9, if you've ever seen the movie Paul, he's, this book, uh, 2 Timothy, is written in that same time frame. Paul is in prison in Rome. He's in this pit dungeon where they're holding him captive. It's not like the first time he was in prison where he had a house to himself and he'd kind of go as he pleased and provide for himself. This time he's in a pit dungeon and he's there underneath this and he knows that his life is nearing an end. And this letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy, is a letter to put his affairs in order, to encourage Timothy in the purpose and calling of God so that when Paul is gone, because Paul knows his life is nearing the end, when Paul is gone, Timothy will be able to continue the work. And in these, and at the end of his life, Paul writes and says, Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia, and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in ministry. I love this picture, that at the end of his life, Paul comes back around, and he says, you know, bring Mark with you. He'd really be helpful to me. You know, back there in Acts chapter 16, he wasn't so helpful. I didn't know if I could trust him, but now he's helpful to me. 
And this says a few things for us. Just a little aside here. I want you to see this because from my own life, from my own story, I've been a mark. I've been a guy that needed a second chance. I've been a guy that failed, that's been faulty, and needed someone to say to me, come on, you'll be helpful to me in ministry. And so when Paul sees that in Mark's life, it speaks to all of us. I want you to see that these things are true for us, that your past mistakes don't have to define your future. Just because of what you've done, it doesn't mean that that defines where you're headed. Your past mistakes don't have to define your future. And even more than that, if you mess up in ministry or in life, don't ever feel like you can't get back in the game. The gospel is about restoration. The gospel is about seeing the lost found and the new and the old come to new and the dead come alive. And that means no matter what you've done or if you've fallen or if you've failed, don't ever feel like you can't get back in the game. And then it's never too late to reconnect with someone you've let down. Maybe you need to play the bigger card. Maybe you need to go to them. And I wonder what would have happened if John Mark had gone to Paul and said, hey, look, Paul, buddy, I'm sorry I left you guys in Cyprus. I was wrong. I shouldn't have left. And if you will let me go with you, I promise it won't happen again. And I'll be with you and I'll prove to you I'm useful in ministry. I wonder what would have happened if John Mark had done that to Paul. I can only imagine the Holy Spirit would have moved on Paul to say, I forgive you. Let's do this. Let's go. But instead, they parted ways. And that's the other part of this. It's never too late to forgive someone who's let you down. No matter what they've done, in a group this size, and two services, and two campuses, there are probably a lot more people than we realize that are working through, walking through hurts, because of something someone has done to you, even right now, this morning. And I want to encourage you to be like Paul, to accept help from others, to let people off the hook, to forgive and move on. Because just like we all need it, they need it too. And Paul writes throughout his epistles to us and his letters to us, he writes to encourage us that we can receive strength from other people. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, Encourage each other and give each other strength. This is the value of why we do small groups. One of the core reasons why we all need to be connected in a small group. This is awesome. I love our Sunday morning worship experiences. The worship team does an incredible job of leading us into worship, and we get to open up the Word together. And I have loved, 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 loved walking through the book of Acts with you. It's just been such an encouragement and an empowerment to me personally. And so I love these times together. But this is the, this is the celebration. This is the encouragement. This is the pep talk at the beginning of the week. You should be out in, the, in your everyday life in a small group doing life together. That's where the rubber meets the road. And that's where you can do this, where you can encourage each other and give each other strength. In fact, so much so that Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 that by helping each other with your troubles, you obey the law of Christ. What does that mean for us? That means we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our mind, and our strength. And we love our neighbor as ourselves. And we do this, then we're doing that. And so I want to encourage you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've not been a part of a small group. Our fall semester is starting very soon. Begin to pray and begin to talk to your friends and find out which small group they're a part of and get connected. Many of the small groups didn't stop for the summer semester. You can get connected to small groups now. And our fall semester kickoff will happen at the early part of September. Look forward to that, to find a small group that you can be a part of. And many of you, maybe you're being moved and prompted as we've been walking through Acts and you've seen that the church spreads and expands and they're meeting in house to house. Maybe you're being challenged to start a small group. We need about double the small groups that we actually have. We have about 25 different small groups that happen throughout the week. And we really need about 50 to meet all of the pastoral need and the places for people to go and belong to. We have small groups and we see them in all ranges of different things. And so no matter what it is, if you have an activity or a hobby that you could center a group around or just a Bible study or you just want to make an opportunity for people to get together and do this, do that. 
because we need to be together in community, loving each other and encouraging each other and giving each other strength. And that's the only way we'll make it through is if we allow each other to help each other. And then the third thing is that we trust God in things that we don't understand. As Paul is continuing on in his journey, and they're going through different places. In every place, he finds opposition and persecution, and they're run out of town after town after town, and they come here into Acts chapter 16. And it's interesting, they're traveling through this area, and they receive, they, they can't go. They're stopped by the Holy Spirit to go to one place in Asia, and they try to go to a different place in Asia, and they can't go there. And then they come to, the, they, Paul gets this vision. And it's this vision of a man calling them to Macedonia. And so they think, this is it. This is going to be awesome. In fact, we read it here in Acts chapter 16. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had present, prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there, pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. So just, just paint this picture with me. Just think about this a little bit. Now, we're taking a team, Steph and I and Jim and Doretha and several others, and we're all going to Mongolia in September. If, if as a team, like we're meeting, a team meeting this this Wednesday to pray together. And during this prayer time, we get a vision of this Mongol dressed up in Mongol clothes, and he's saying to us, come to Mongolia and help us. Like, my own ambition and ego would be like, this is it. This trip is on. It's going to be awesome. We know the Holy Spirit is telling us to go, and they're saying, come and, come and help us. And so when I get there, like my own ego transparency, right, I'm going to expect like crowds, you know, stadiums full of people we're going to preach to, revival is going to break out, like this is going to be amazing. What Paul gets is he can't find anybody to listen to him at all. He so much so that he goes to a riverbank where he thinks some people might gather and he starts preaching to the ladies that are washing their clothes. Captive audience, they can't leave, their clothes are there. So he gets this vision, come to Macedonia, help us. Oh yeah, here we go. We're leaving at once. The Holy Spirit has called us to go. And they get there and nobody. <laughs> I would be a little frustrated. Finally, he makes one convert, this lady Lydia. And she happens to be a, a dealer in purple cloth, so she probably has a little uh, well-to-do and she invites him to come live at their house. And so they finally have a place to stay at least. And they begin to preach around and this slave girl who has a spirit of divination who tells fortunes and stuff for other people, for money, uh, is following Paul around, shouting all kinds of stuff. This is a man of God. Come hear the man of God. Like Paul just finally gets frustrated with the whole thing and silences her, throws out the, de the demon. And he her owners don't appreciate that very much, so they throw him in jail. And here in the middle of the night, Paul and Silas in jail in Philippi are worshiping and praising God. There's something about trusting God in every circumstance, no matter what happens, even when you don't understand. I would be frustrated. I had a vision of a man calling me here, and I can't even get any men to listen to me. The only convert I've had is this lady Lydia who was washing her clothes, and now this slave girl, and now I'm in jail. And even in the midst of this, I will worship, and I will praise God, and I will trust him frustration after frustration, and yet Paul trusts God in every circumstance because God doesn't, ever, doesn't answer every prayer the way we want it. He does answer every prayer. It's just not the way we want it. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says, you do it. I put it on your heart to pray to me because I'm putting it on your heart. You do it. You say, God, I need some money to pay this bill. And God says, get a job. You do it. No matter what it is, sometimes God says, you're not going to get this one. You're not going to understand this one. Just trust me. You're going to have to just trust me. And Paul says it this way. 
in Colossians chapter 2. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. So when you read that, is your faith based on your circumstance? Is your faith situational? What you're going through and where you are, if it's up or down, or is it relational? I know who I believe in, and I'm certain that he will keep me. Is it situational or is it relational? Are you praying for rescue? God, get me out of this situation that I'm in. I, need, I know I've put myself here, but I need you to get me out. Or are you praying for revelation? God, help me to see what you're doing. Help me to understand and trust you in the midst of this. Are you praying for rescue or revelation? In all things, we should trust God. And when we don't know what else to do, I want to encourage you with this. When you don't know what else to do and you can't see the situation or the circumstance or how to get through it, we can do what we do know. You can pray what you do know. Remind yourself of what you do know about God. I know that God is good and he's a loving God. God's word tells me so. I know that he is all-powerful. First Timothy says that he is the only one who is immortal. He alone dwells in unapproachable light. That's the God that we serve. That's the God we pray to. Read these verses. First Timothy 6.16 is an amazing description. Paul just breaks out into this doxology of how incredible God is. I know that he's all-powerful. I know that he notices every detail of my life. Psalm 139 talks about that God knows when you lay down and when you get up. He knows every step you're going to take before you take it. He knows every word you're going to say before you say it. He knows every detail of your life and that he is in control. His plans and his purposes will not fail. He's in control. I know that God has a plan for my life, and if I seek him, I will find it. I don't have to seek the plan. I just have to seek God. Listen to that. That's for somebody. God has a plan for your life. You don't seek the plan. You seek God, and you'll find the plan in the process. And I know that God will protect me. No matter what happens, I know that God has this. I can trust him. So when I don't understand, when I don't know the situation, I don't know the circumstances, and I don't know what to do, I can rest in what I do know. These are truths, attributes of God, his character, things that I do know. You may not feel it, but God is passionately paying attention to every detail of your life, and he is with you, even when you don't see him or feel him. And finally, Paul just settles it in his mind. In 2 Timothy, he says, this is why I'm suffering here in prison. I'm not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. Paul just says, I know I can trust him. I've given my entire life to him. I've laid it all down before him, and I'm sure that I can trust him with it. And we can say that too. We can be encouraged by Paul to say the same thing. And when we do, the fourth thing we see from Paul's life is that we can face the future with courage. We know that when everything else, we can do that. We can face the future with courage because God is with us. In fact, we see this from Paul's life. As he continues on, he's oppressed and persecuted in every city that he goes to. He talks about it on and on and on, how every place he comes to, he finds opposition. And when he comes to Corinth in Acts chapter 18, the Jews rally against him and revolt against him so much so that he can't get a word out. They won't let him speak, and so he washes his hands of them. He says, fine, you won't listen to me? I'll go to the Gentiles. And he begins to speak to the Gentiles, and the Lord gives him this word in Acts chapter 18. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack and harm you, for many people in this city belong to me. I want you to receive that for yourself, that you can proceed. You can face the future with courage because God is with you. 
He is there with you, and he will protect you. He says, I am with you, and no one will attack or harm you. And I believe that's true, especially in this city, in Claremore. There are many people who call God the Lord. And we can proceed. We can be super normal, and we can face the future with courage. And when we do, Paul says it will look like this. Philippians chapter 4. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. What happens when we do these four things like Paul did? When we're able to express all of our emotion and just give it all to him, to just empty out all of our frustration and challenges and feelings into God, and then ask and accept help from other people to walk this life together as we're called to, and then be able to trust God even when we don't understand and face the future with courage. What happens when we do that? This. We learn the secret of living in every situation because we know that the strength of the Lord is with us, Christ who gives us strength. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, and I want to pray over you. I want to ask our prayer teams to come forward, and they're going to be here for you at the end of the service. I want our prayer teams to be here because I feel like there are some people here today that are going through some challenges. Maybe you're walking through a difficult circumstance or situation, and you need someone to pray with you, to stand with you, to help and encourage and strengthen you, to help you to see that God is in control even when you don't understand. You need someone to help you face the future with courage. This is, these prayer teams are here for you to be the faith family of Destiny Life, to walk through this life together. They're here for you. And for all of us this morning, I want to pray over us that this would work in us, that we would have super normal courage. We would be able to face life no matter what no matter what. Because we receive our strength, not from our own ability, but from him who gives us strength. So Father, we thank you for the life of Paul and for the illustration that it is of how we can get up and keep going. I thank you for this family of faith at Destiny Life, that it would be real and true of us, that we are pressed but not crushed. We are persecuted but not abandoned. We are knocked down but not destroyed because we get up and we keep on going. You have made us super normal. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us. Help us to just release everything to you, not to suppress it, not to express it to other people, but to confess it to you. I pray that you would help us to be open, not to isolate ourselves as the enemy wants us to, but to reach out and to be an encouragement and a strength to others and let them be an encouragement and a strength to us. I pray that you'd help us to stand firm and strong, to trust in you even when we don't understand. And through all of that, by your strength, you will give us the strength to face the future with courage. As your word says, we pray that you'll be filled with his mighty, glorious strength so that you can keep going no matter what happens, always full of the joy of the Lord. I pray that that would be real and true for us, that we would have strength no matter what. We thank you for putting in us the Holy Spirit, the power to be a witness, to be supernormal. In Jesus' name, amen.